Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Um, before I start uh, the talk, um, the previous but last speaker talked about structural integrity. On um, UAV, structural integrity is possible. But what I am going to talk about is structural integrity and certification. Certification is a clear topic which is unresolved at the moment. Before uh, going any further, uh, let's uh, look at the definition of what is unmanned. An unmanned, uh, an unmanned uh, aircraft is where there isn't a pilot. And uh, it's not a new idea. The first UAV that ever flew was in 1913. Uh, that's a long time ago. It shows how innovative a human brain is. People have been thinking about UAVs for a long time, but it's only recently, the last 10 or 15 years, when we really started going into it. Uh, myself, without realizing and going into details of all the documentation, now realize that we were working on uh, UAVs about 15 years ago. Uh, the first one was called Phoenix, and it was flown uh, in identified fields, um, and the other one was Dindavik, that was also developed, uh, the avionics was uh, developed by Marconi Defense Systems at the time. What I'll look at is, i look at the origins of structural airworthiness, where it all started from, i look at the uh, route for design approvals, airworthiness standards, and then we'll look at the considerations, factors that uh, need developing for sense and avoid criteria. And we'll go on to some safety aspects and then finally conclusion. Where, where did all this start? Uh, before the war, Second World War, I wasn't born then, uh, but Second World War when the uh, pioneers started developing flying machines, there were a lot of accidents. Um, there wasn't any data to fall back to create good designs. This, this led to uh, looking, setting up a committee that would look into how do we make safe uh, aircrafts. And uh, this, uh, this developed, uh, the government appointed a body which is the Royal uh, Aircraft Establishment in Farnborough to look into it. Um, I'll come back to this slide, uh, but first go into the origins, how it came about. The first ever standards that came about were uh, a book called uh, Hand Calculations. These were actually guidelines to how do you do structural analysis of aircrafts. Over the years, this same book was developed into uh, defense standards. Uh, defense standards we use even today, 00970. Uh, 00970 looks into uh, UAV certification. The exact uh, chapter is chapter 9. Um, this, uh, was the, this came into being in 1986 when uh, uh, the Ministry of Defense looked at how, how do we actually certify UAVs. This study went on for two years. I was involved with this working group. We really didn't get anywhere um, because we did not have enough knowledge on this topic. Subsequently, this committee was transferred over to a committee called JTRC, Joint Technical Research Committee for Weapon Systems. Um, as you are aware, weapon systems are more closer to UAVs. For example, a cruise missile. Cruise missile is basically a UAV system, but it's programmed and it works with the GPS system. And that's where the UAV thinking has come about. I'll go back to the slide again. Um, how, 
how does the system work? In the early days, um, every company, approved company, had a resident technical officer from the Ministry of Defense. Such was the safety implication. The actual uh, RTO uh, would actually check calculation and then accept drawings. What, what is the definition of airworthiness? This is something that comes from the 00970. Uh, a UAV must show an equivalent integrity of a manned aircraft. What does the CAA policy dictate on UAVs? More or less similar. Uh, you must certify a UAV exactly as a manned aircraft. What does the NATO, uh, NATO uh, documentation say? Similar things. Uh, the reality is we do not have procedures as yet how to certify a UAV. So the only alternate or the fallback is go back to the manned aircraft. How do you certify a manned aircraft? The ministries around the world, I believe, do demand you certify a UAV just as a manned aircraft. I'll go a little bit back to uh, the design approval route. How do you go about it? Um, in, in the UK, the Secretary of State is responsible for anything that flies. Um, he, in turn, delegates it to service chiefs, the Air Force, the Army, Navy, and they, in turn, appoint uh, uh, officers that look at the three services. And uh, the ADRP1, the ADR2P, uh, as it says, look after various standards. Uh, the ADRP2 look at the uh, aircraft industry, and the ADRP3 looks at the weapon systems. And MOD have, a, uh, have an approval scheme. Um, we listened here uh, for the past two days. They want a lot of SMEs to go into defense work. Companies cannot go into defense work just by saying we are going into it. They have to be approved. Do they have the right system? Do they have the design capability? Do they have the qualified staff? Um, how you do it, I think, is similar to what we do in the UK. They actually come and look at our quality system. Do they exist that can develop a weapon system or an avionic system? Do you have the right staff? Are you approved to uh, uh, defense quality standards? So this is, this is the procedure what every SME would have to go if uh, the privatized industry wants to go into uh, defense work. I'll, uh, as I mentioned, uh, my background is structures. I've been uh, clearing structural integrity on our systems for the last 25 years. This is the model uh, for not just aircraft, but even all the avionics. Uh, we, we make avionic equipment that goes into various aircrafts. And the certification process for, for the avionics is just as stringent as the aircraft itself. Um, take, for example, a black box situated in the cockpit. If, if it was to become loose, can you imagine the impact it would have? It could become a flying object within the cockpit and hence leading to a serious accident. So we use the same principle. Um, this uh, slide is out of our uh, airworthiness manuals which our company has, and it's been approved by the Ministry of Defense, how we go through actually certifying our equipment. Uh, details of this are in the paper with an annex. 
what is the CAA uh, policy on unmanned aircraft? Again, the same thing. It must meet the same requirements as a manned aircraft. I don't think there is any UAV flying around that is certified at the moment. They are cleared for structural integrity. They can fly, but they are only flying in limited airspace. Air I'll come to that in, in a moment. So far, it's not demonstrated that they can sense and avoid. What does that mean? You have a UAV that can detect an oncoming threat, another aircraft, mid-air collision. This, uh, this technology is being developed, and we are running trials on it. I think uh, UAV designers have found it very hard to find a solution to that. Uh, we, we are doing a number of trials at the moment. We've been doing them for the last three years. And I will show it in photographic evidence what we are trying to do. There are other, other areas who are similarly looking at it. In fact, everyone, uh, the defense standards, the CAA standards, the NATO standards, the JAC, JAC standards, they are all addressing this issue. We do not have an answer yet. I, I think you are listening to me here to see, do I have an answer? Um, if I go back uh, Ten years ago, when we first introduced mathematical model, modeling as evidence, it took us a long time to actually accept that mathematical models could be used for certification. We are going through the same procedures at the moment. Uh, do we have enough knowledge? Do we have enough techniques and capabilities to say that our equipment will replace a man in the cockpit? We'll uh, briefly look at the type airworthiness approval. What is uh, involved with it? It's very much similar to a, a normal aircraft that is manned. Uh, we would uh, go through uh, calculations. We would uh, verify mathematical models by testing. We would do safety hazard analysis. We would do testing, vibration, shock, acceleration, and uh, we would do the electrical tests, the software tests. We would look at the communication data links. But again, in this concept, we have a pilot that can respond back to us, uh, which isn't present in a UAV at the moment. We would look at the manufacturer's airworthiness statements, and we would produce our manuals, safety manuals, procedural manuals. What are the criteria you would look for uh, airworthiness of a UAV? Obviously, the most important is weight and balance. Very important are the flight performance things, which would look into speed, takeoff, uh, climb rates, landing, bulk landing if, if required. This is something we are doing at the moment. We've been doing for two years. Um, we are doing with a company set up by um, ex-Red Arrow pilots um, who do a lot of displays. And we approached them, would you be interested in actually testing UAV systems? And their answer was yes, because they, they are the risk takers. What, what this actually sh uh, shows is not a mid-air mid, mid collision, but what we do is we have a, uh, an aircraft where we're putting our systems on, and they in turn bring in their experienced red arrow pilots that actually threaten the aircraft, and they will approach it so that, they, so that our equipment can detect is there an oncoming threat. I'll... Uh, Briefly describe that. 
A typical uh, aviation side air, aircraft we're using for the test is the Navajo. Uh, it's a twin propelled aircraft, ideal for it. Now, what are the requirements for sense awareness? You as pilots, some of the pilots here know what sort of distance you need to see to be safe. When I say seeing, I don't mean physically with the eye, with the with this uh, equipment you got, it's 4.5 nautical miles. I'm not sure about a fighter plane, but commercially, 4.5 nautical miles. And if you look at practically, uh, the padlock receding target is 4.3 nautical miles. Expected head-on threat, that is a collision, you should be able to see at 2.3 nautical miles. The company we uh, uh, are using at the moment, we're also given money by uh, the Pilots Association in the UK to uh, look at the study, how many air miles have been done from 1999 to 2008. And the probabilistic mid-air collision factor came to 10 to the uh, 1 to 10 to the minus 6 flight hours. So the risk of uh, mid-air collision is pretty remote. Looking at the safety, um, the worst scenario is severity one. Um, it's an in inability to continue flight safely. It's really a crash condition. These, uh, these uh, safety criteria are given by CAA. This is not something we are inventing. Uh, second severity is a failure condition leading to a controlled loss of a UAV over an emergency site. Third one is uh, leading, leading to uh, significant reduction in safety margin. Safety margin here doesn't mean uh, disintegration. It means could it be landed safely. Severity four is the failure condition leading to slight reduction in margin safety. And safety five uh, would be failure condition leading to no safety effects. So what, what, what are the uh, safety ground rules and criteria? We have to look at the locations. Uh, would you, where would you land a UAV in case of an emergency? Really in un, in uninhabited uh, places where, where there's no population. Um, locations that should be able to reach them considering gliding capability, emergency recovery procedures, and emergency removal capabilities. What's the MOD policy in the UK? Routine operations of any UAV outside the danger zone must increase the risk to other aerospace users. And this should not deny the airspace to them. This is the basic criteria, and I think it's common everywhere around the world. Any one of unusual air activity that requires deconfliction with coordination with notification to other aerospace users should be notified to the director of aerospace programs. And from the air traffic controller's uh, view, the provision of the air traffic service to the UAV must be transparent. So the key words for UAV flying is transparency and avoid. Uh, can we achieve it? To certain degrees, we are on the way to achieving it. Um, if you would ask me, have we achieved it? I think we, we are a fair way away. But trials that are being carried out at the moment are pretty promising. Present reality. 
I think these are not my words. These are the words that came out of the Pilots Association. Uh, they did a study, and they turned out and said it's a moot. And I think in many ways I agree with it. Uh, uh, it is a moot. We, we do not really know enough at the moment. Without numerical performance requirement, UAV design have found it hard to invent sense and avoid solutions. The definition of unmanned is an aircraft without a pilot on board. In 2008, NATO uh, committee looked at uh, the UAV, and uh, there are the, these are the conclusions from them. An acceptable uh, level of safety across all types of operations in all types of airspace was one mid-air collision occurrence every 200 million flying hours. A mid-air collision per aircraft flight risk was 5 to 10 to the minus 9. International Civil Aviation has introduced target level of safety. This is being used uh, right across UK and the NATO countries. Mathematical modeling, uh, modeling defines this, but not valid for all type of aircrafts. Now I'll come to some of the um, trials we are doing. This is what we want from UAVs. We want our equipment to replace the sky. It's not so easy. Uh, we, are not, we are not totally sure whether our equipment is 100% and we are not sure whether our equipment can respond as this guy would respond in a real situation. This is one of the aircraft we are using for trials. Uh, our equipment looks through the propeller. These are impact cameras. Uh, you can use very sophisticated equipment to actually see is there an oncoming target. These are very cheap cameras. They respond to uh, impact. What we what we done here, uh, this is a Navajo aircraft flying with the cameras on, and we, we got uh, red arrows that come towards it, diving at various angles. Can these cameras pick up? They do pick up that uh, there's an oncoming threat. So we are experimenting and we are trying out various equipment. This is the Navajo aircraft we are using for trials. Uh, we are obviously not using our equipment on real air UAVs at the moment. This is uh, a typical equipment we are using at the moment. Um, these are the cameras that look out. This is the other equipment, recording equipment, looking at the threats. This is what uh, the cockpit sees when they're looking at the threat. At the moment, I can't describe this uh, because we're still getting out trials. This is another set of our equipment under the carriage of the Navajo aircraft. That's the aircraft we're using. And this shows the level of uh, area that's been covered by our equipment. We have radars at the end. We have equipment inside, cameras there. That looks at the end, cameras. I believe our algorithms are working the wavelength. Uh, we've been doing the trials for the last three years. The results are promising, and uh, we intend to be carrying out these trials uh, in India as well for some of the research labs. Closing remarks. Um, Really, the main one is for UAVs, detect and avoid. 
Can we do that? I think we are on the way. We are looking at it and it's looking promising. There is a talk of virtual certification. A committee set up by a number of aerospace companies. Um, I'm not sure about it. I put it in there because they are looking at the future. How do you virtually certify a, a UAV? I don't think we can even certify a manned aircraft virtually, but these guys are looking at it. The results should be um, interesting. I think the key word here is uh, command, control, and communication. Um, if we can achieve that, I think UAV certification is possible. We are in early days. Um, no one is able to do it at the moment, but there are procedures being written at the moment that are looking at how do we certify a UAV. Um, uh, defense standards are looking at it. Uh, JAC is looking at it. ESA, the European standards, are looking at it. We are all coming to the same conclusions at the moment. Uh, there isn't enough that we know how to certify, fully certify a UAV. Yes, we are flying UAVs around the world, but these are in areas, in war areas, or in limited uh, airspace. I think it's an area for wide discussion. It's not something uh, you can conclude at the moment. Um, Yesterday, I proposed to SEMILAC that they should join in on some of these committees where you become a part of the discussion panel and to see where, where we are going for the future. Thank you very much.